Amen. Praise God. Welcome uh, to our Saturday morning meeting. Uh, we could recall this convention meetings. Uh, we're very serious about this business of winning men to Jesus Christ. And we, we love the souls of men. We're very burdened. And especially for those in cults that are caught up in false teaching, uh, whether within our churches or whether in separate sects and cults, and uh, here in Limerick City uh, Church, we have always endeavored to reach out to Mormons, JWs, and the whosoever with the message of what Christ has done on the cross in dying for them, and to preach a clear message that is in line with the Word of God. And that's why we're putting these meetings on both today and over this weekend, because uh, we really want to reach them. It's one thing to point out what is wrong. And... It is easy to criticize those that are deceived, but to reach them with the power of the gospel, we must know something uh, about what they are, and we must be burdened in heart. And I really pray as you listen these important messages here this morning today, that the Lord will burden your heart, not merely to reject those in cults, not merely to scorn them or to criticize, but to be passionate with the love of Jesus Christ, to reach out, to have faith, to pray for them. And it's something as a church we've endeavored to do. We've held meetings where Mormon missionaries were in t attendance. We've reached out to them as they evangelize in our streets coming from other uh, countries. They've come here to evangelize this city. We have always endeavored to reach out to them and in fact to target them to reach out with the love of Christ and with the clear gospel. So I really pray that we will burden our hearts deeply for those who need Jesus Christ and not only in these two cults, but all those who don't understand what Jesus has done on the cross for them. It's wonderful again to have uh, Cecil Andrews from Take Heed Ministries in Northern Ireland. Uh, he's been a, a great blessing to us already. Last night, we had a wonderful night's fellowship with him and his uh, dear wife, Margaret. And we appreciate him being here today to minister um, on these vital subjects. So I'm going to hand over straight to Cecil and ask him to take his liberty here. And let's be prayerful as we listen that the Lord would really speak to us and inspire our hearts with these things and create a deep cry within our hearts, praying for them, um, that the Lord would really move in these days to save and to bring them into our midst. So Brother Cecil, it's just wonderful to have you uh, with us again today. We pray the Lord will give you liberty as you speak, and uh, the Lord will really use you in our midst here this morning, and uh, to all those who watch the videos afterwards. God bless you this morning. Amen. Well, thank you, Brother Keith, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's a privilege for both Margaret and myself to be actually down here in Limerick, and we pray that the Lord will bless the ministry this morning. Uh, I want to begin just by reading a few verses of Scripture that are particularly applicable to the subject matter in our first talk, and I'm going to uh, pause letter to the Galatians, uh, Galatians chapter 1, and I want to read just verses 6 through to nine. So this is God's word. Paul writes, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. And we should really take note, particularly where Paul said, though we are an angel from heaven, that has great relevance to our subject matter in this first session. Uh, 19th century America was a real hotbed of religious activity. All sorts of new ideas were being formulated. And the result was that during that century, a number of pseudo-Christian groups that are basically cults emerged. Uh, I can think of the Church of Christ, uh, the Seventh-day Adventists, Christian Science, and the Christadelphians, uh, those emerged in the 19th century. But there were two other groups, the uh, Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness, that were also birthed 
in that century. And this morning, we're going to be looking at the Mormons, or to give them their full title, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. When I was speaking to you at the end of May in the question and answer section, uh, I was asked about cults. And I said, there's usually four features that from a Christian standpoint, we can identify in the groups that we label as cults. Uh, and those four points were an earthly head or founder, an authority in addition to or in place of the Bible, a wrong view of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then a wrong view of salvation. And we're certainly going to see those features as I work through the presentations this morning on both of these groups. Just a little by way of introduction, uh, first of all, on what I would call the man of Mormonism. Uh, in December 1805, Joseph Smith was born in Vermont. Uh, then his family moved to New York State. And in 1820, uh, he was living near a place called Palmyra, and it's claimed that there was a religious revival had taken place amongst the denominations, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, and the Baptists. And the official storyline is that young Joseph went out into the woods to pray, to ask God to see which of these groups he should actually join. And he claims that two heavenly figures appeared to him in the woods, uh, declaring themselves to be God the Father and the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And apparently Joseph was told, you're not to join any of the religious groupings. They're all wrong. Their creeds are an abomination to him. So that is uh, uh, foundational to the Mormons is this first vision that Joseph had. Uh, the problem is that over the years, I think Joseph came up with two or three differing versions of it and others came up with differing versions of it. But that is the basis of uh, this revelation supposedly given uh, to Joseph Smith. Uh, so that was in 1820, and then three years later, another important vision happened uh, at his bedside, an angel uh, declaring himself to be uh, Moroni appeared uh, and told Joseph that uh, at a hill near New York called Camorra, there were gold plates buried and they had strange writing on them, uh, supposedly reformed Egyptian, which is a totally unknown language. No linguist knows anything about it. And uh, Moroni said that these plates contained the history of the early inhabitants of the, the Americas. And uh, Joseph, he was not allowed immediately to take possession of these uh, plates. It was actually four years later before he was able to take possession of them. And as well as the plates, he also got two uh, crystal glasses tied by a ribbon. And they were called Urim and Tummim. And these were supposedly to enable him to be able to translate the writing on the uh, gold plates. He didn't actually start to translate until two years later in 1829. By that stage, he had been married for about eight years to a lady called Emma. And with the help of a man called Oliver Cowdery, he began the translation of these plates. Uh, also at that time, he and Oliver Cowdery again went into the woods to pray. And it's claimed that John the Baptist appeared to them and he inducted them into the Aaronic priesthood, which meant that they could uh, baptize people for the remission of sins. And John the Baptist told them that shortly Peter, James, and John would appear to them and induct them into the Melchizedek priesthood. Uh, can I just say, uh, you know, young Mormon boys, when they reach 12, they are inducted normally if they're in good standing into the Aaronic priesthood. And then at the age of 19, they would be inducted into the Melchizedek priesthood. So most of the, the bright, uh, white-shirted Mormon missionary men that you meet are probably in the Melchizedek priesthood. Can I say, first of all, the Aaronic priesthood is utterly redundant. It was made redundant when the Lord Jesus Christ cried out on the cross, it is finished. 
the Aaronic priesthood, the purpose was for those priests to offer animal sacrifices on behalf of repentant sinners who had come up to the temple. Um, but when Christ was hanging on the cross, uh, the Aaronic priests were about to uh, sacrifice the Passover lamb on the Temple Mount. And I believe that as he was hanging on the cross, he was looking across there, and when he declared, finished, he was basically saying to them, you can stop all of that. that. That only pictured the work that I have just accomplished. So the Aaronic priesthood, there's no place for it uh, today. And as for the Melchizedek priesthood, well, there is only one holder of that priesthood, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's an untransferable priesthood because he lives in the power of an endless life. In the Old Testament, the Aaronic priesthood, priests died and had to be replaced. But Christ holds the Melchizedek priesthood, and he is uniquely the only person who holds that priesthood. Uh, the Book of Mormon eventually was translated and appeared in 1830. Uh, this angel, Moroni, uh, revealed to Joseph that it told, as I say, the history of the early inhabitants of the Americans. And the story goes that a man, a Jewish man called Lehi and his family, they fled from Jerusalem uh, towards the end of the 6th century uh, BC. And they sailed across to the Americas and uh, the Mormons would say, tell you it's probably Central America is where they landed. Uh, Lehi had a number of sons, uh, including Nephi and Laman. And uh, Nephi was fair and handsome and good, uh, but Laman was dark skinned and a bit of a surly sort of a character. And there was an ongoing feud between Nephi and Laman. The story goes then that uh, in 34 AD, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, appeared to the descendants uh, of Nephi and Laman, the Nephites and the Lamanites, and he revealed to them the fullness of the everlasting gospel. And as a result of his uh, visit, there was a peace that pertained for a couple of hundred years after that. But then eventually strife broke out again between the Nephites and the Lamanites, culminating in a huge battle in about 385 AD at Cumorah, that hill where the plates were supposedly buried. And the bad guys, the Lamanites, defeated the good guys, the Nephites. And Moroni, in fact, was a, really the last of the survivors of that battle. And it was his father, Mormon, who had been transcribing the history onto the gold plates and then Moroni finished it off and he buried it in the hillside. So that is the, the, the history of the visitation of Moroni to Joseph Smith and the, supposedly what these gold plates had upon them. Uh, in 1830 then the church was constituted and uh, although the Book of Mormon had been published, uh, Joseph claimed that he was continuing to receive other revelations from God. And so those were written down also, and they were put in a book called Doctrine and Covenants. And uh, the Book of Mormon, uh, it, it's more of a historical record rather than a doctrinal record. And the Doctrine and Covenants, it contains much more of the doctrines that are peculiar to the Mormon church, such as things as baptism for the dead, celestial marriage, the priesthoods, and also polygamy. Another book that the Mormons have is called the Pearl of Great Price. It's normally included in the same volume as the Doctrine and Covenants, and it contains uh, our, the Book of Moses, which is really a rewriting of Genesis, and also the Book of Abraham, uh, which was supposedly written by Abraham during his time in Egypt. Uh, and it contained important teachings and so on. And uh, it was based on a papyrus that Joseph Smith had bought and then translated. Uh, unfortunately for the Mormons, the papyrus actually turned up in a New York museum in 1966. And linguists were able to properly translate what was on it. And it had absolutely nothing to do with Abraham's time in Egypt. It was actually the funeral rites of people who would die 
uh, and so on. So uh, it was shown that, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Smith, you were telling porkies when it came to this particular translation. Uh, I mentioned that uh, Joseph Smith had married a girl called Emma. Uh, one of the revelations that he got was uh, that it was okay to practice polygamy. And he wasn't only someone who spoke the word, he was a doer of the word. And uh, it's reckoned he accumulated something like 25 wives uh, over a period of time. Now this uh, practice of polygamy, it led to opposition from people in the area that they were based in and they had to move a few times and they eventually went to a place called Novu uh, and uh, Joseph Smith became the mayor but some uh, former Mormons who had defected uh, they owned the, the local uh, expositor it was the newspaper and they printed articles which were uh, critical of this idea of polygamy. So Smith and others broke in and destroyed the printing presses. And for that, he and uh, his brother and several others were arrested and they were put in prison in Carthage in Illinois. And then in uh, June of 1844, a mob broke in and actually killed uh, Joseph Smith and his brother. And so uh, the Mormon church would claim that he was a martyr for the faith. So that is sort of a potted history uh, of Joseph Smith. Uh, he was succeeded by Brigham Young and uh, Brigham Young decided uh, in February of 1846 that they needed to relocate again. And so they, the Mormons loaded up all their goods on a whole several hundred hand carts and uh, wagons and they began what is known as the Great Trek West. And in July 1847, they arrived on a hilltop and uh, Brigham Young looked down onto Salt Lake Valley. And the famous declaration is that he said, this is the place. And so that is where the Mormons established themselves in Utah. And that is the site of uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, Joseph Smith and Brigham Young uh, during their time both claimed to be prophets. Uh, and there's records that you can look up uh, online showing many of the false uh, prophecies and sayings that they came out with. Uh, Joseph Smith said that there were people living on the moon who would live for about a thousand years and they were six feet tall. He probably didn't reckon that someday Neil Armstrong would land on the moon and not meet them. Uh, he also declared that uh, in 1832, the New Jerusalem would be built in Jackson County in Missouri. Well, of course, that didn't happen. And there are other false prophecies and sayings. Uh, Brigham Young, likewise, he went one better than Joseph Smith. He uh, said that there were people living on the sun. Well, I don't know what suntan X factor they would need if that was going to be the case, but you can understand the nonsense of that. Uh, he also said the American Civil War would not end slavery, which of course it did. And uh, he then taught that only those who uh, practice polygamy would become gods because we're going to see what the Mormons teach about the uh, eternal life that each of the uh, followers uh, of their religion can aspire to. So that very briefly is the, the man of Mormonism. I want to move now to what I would call the message of Mormonism. Uh, what exactly is it that these people believe? And I'll do it under a, a series of headings. Uh, and the first I would give you is twisted theology. Uh, theology is just our, our understanding of God and so on. And uh, you're going to find that the Mormons have a twisted theology. Uh, in the uh, Pearl of Great Price, uh, you have the 13 Articles of Faith of the Mormon Church. And the first article of faith says this, We believe in God, the Eternal Father, and in His Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. Now, to the uninitiated, that, that sounds quite biblical and uh, Trinitarian until you compare it with other teachings in the Mormon scriptures. And if we go to the Doctrine and Covenants that I mentioned in, in section 130, this is what you can read. The Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's, the Son also, but the Holy Ghost has not a body of flesh 
and bones. So here we find that despite the orthodox sounding article one of the uh, Mormon church, it is very unbiblical and anti-scriptural. Uh, I have to recognize that when Joseph Smith was teaching, uh, he was a bit like a, a, a Mormon Pope. You know, he, his words had to be basically uh, regarded as the words from God when he spoke on matters of faith and morals. Uh, in one of the Mormon's books, uh, it says this, that Mormons are commanded to give heed unto all his, that is Joseph Smith's words and commandments, which he shall give unto you as he receiveth them. For his word ye shall receive as if from mine own mouth. That's a quote actually from Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, the late Walter Martin, who wrote a book called uh, The Maze of Mormonism, he gave a very good quote attributed to Joseph Smith. Uh, this is what Joseph Smith apparently said. God made Aaron to be the mouthpiece for the children of Israel, and he will make me be God to you in his stead, and the elders to be mouth for me. And if you don't like it, you must lump it. Well, there you go. There's a man claiming to be a prophet of God saying, if you don't like what I say, well, you've got to lump it uh, type of thing. So uh, as I say, uh, this is how the Mormons regard the, the writings and teachings of Joseph Smith. Well, what about this twisted theology uh, of the Godhead of Mormonism? Uh, first of all, could I say that they are not Trinitarian, they are uh, polytheistic. Uh, they believe that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are three individual gods. Uh, there's a book called The Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, and he said, God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost are three distinct personages and three gods. Uh, that was Joseph Smith. And then a more recent apostle, Bruce McConkie, uh, he said this, three separate personages, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost comprise the Godhead. As each of these persons is a God, it is evident from this standpoint alone that a plurality of gods exists. To us, speaking in the proper finite sense, these are the only gods we worship. In other words, they're saying these are the three gods that we worship. But we're going to see that they believe there's thousands of other gods out there, but these are the three that they personally worship. So who are these three gods? Well, what about uh, God the Father? Well, he is known to Mormons by the name of Elohim. And the story goes that uh, he was a, a man. He was born as the child of unknown other gods. He lived on a planet similar to planet Earth, and he obeyed all the rules of the everlasting gospel. He died, he rose again, and then he was exalted to become a god. In uh, one of the Mormon books, The Gospel Through the Ages, it says, God the Eternal Father was once a mortal man who passed through a school of earth life similar to that through which we are now passing. He became God, an exalted being, through obedience to the same eternal gospel truths that we are given opportunity today to obey. So that is their God the Father. Elohim, he's a man who became a God. Uh, Brigham Young actually taught that Adam who was in the Garden of Eden, was actually the God uh, Father. And uh, that doctrine caused a lot of confusion and debate in Mormonism. And uh, Brigham Young held to it right up to his death. But today, Mormonism wouldn't advocate that. And probably most of the Mormons uh, today wouldn't know anything about it. But anyhow, uh, their God, the Father, Elohim, he's a man who became a God. And he in turn lives on a star near a place called Kolob with his heavenly wives. And there they are procreating spirit children. Uh, a friend of mine, a girl called Sharon, who used to be a Mormon, uh, the thing that triggered her questioning of Mormonism was the fact that not only did she have a heavenly father, but she was also told that she had a heavenly mother. There's a Mormon hymn, which the words of it go like this. In the heavens are parents single? Question mark. No, the thought makes reason stare. Truth is reason, truth eternal. 
tells me I have a mother there. So the uh, child began to question, do I have a heavenly mother? And one thing led to another. And the upshot was that she eventually got truly saved and rejected all of Mormonism. But as I say, it's affirmed uh, in Mormon uh, writings. Uh, one of their leading spokesmen, Milton Hunter, he said, the stupendous truth of the existence of a heavenly mother as well as a heavenly father became established facts in Mormon theology. So the Mormon God, the Father, is an exalted man called Elohim. He has a body of flesh and bones, and he lives on a star near Kolob with his heavenly wives. What does the Bible tell us about God, the Father? Well, if we remember the incident of the Lord with the uh, Samaritan woman uh, at the well, and uh, we read in John 4, verse 23, this is what the Lord says, True worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So the Lord Jesus Christ was talking about God the Father, and he declared that he is a spirit. He does not have flesh and bones. So uh, there's an immediate clash with the Bible uh, in the understanding of God the Father when it comes to uh, the Mormon God the Father. Uh, we also find, of course, that uh, this God the Father in Mormonism, uh, there was a time when he came into being. But is that what the Bible tells us about God? Uh, Psalm 90 uh, and verse 2 says this, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Going back into eternity past, God was God. Going forward into eternity future, God will be God. So God the Father is eternal and he's everlasting. Well, the Mormon God the Father doesn't square up to these biblical truths. Uh, according to them, he's not a spirit. He's an exalted man with a body of flesh and bones. He's not eternal. There was a time when he came into being. So what about then the Mormon Lord Jesus Christ? Well, uh, in the Old Testament, uh, there are many predictions and prophecies about the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of them, for instance, is in Micah 5, verse 2, uh, which predicts that he would be born in Bethlehem. Uh, but the Mormons actually teach that he was born in Jerusalem. So again, they have uh, a different uh, understanding of the birthplace uh, of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that verse, in Micah 5, verse 2, uh, it says this, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. And that means from everlasting, it means uncreated. And of course, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is not created in any sense of the word at all. And we're going to particularly look about at that uh, when we come to the Jehovah's Witnesses later. Uh, so the Mormon Jesus Christ came into being. Uh, they would claim that he was the first spirit child born to Elohim and one of his heavenly wives. Uh, but John 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Christ eternally pre-existed before he incarnated here on the world. And of course, in his great high priestly prayer, he prayed, And now, o Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So the Lord Jesus Christ was eternally pre-existent and co-existent with the Father. Then concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, another prophecy was in Isaiah 7 and verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And Matthew 1, 22 to 23 confirms uh, that that actually related to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
uh, Matthew wrote, now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, and then he quotes Isaiah. It's also important to note what Matthew goes on to say in the wake of those verses. He said, then Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. The true virgin birth, although Mary was conceived uh, by the Holy Ghost and brought forth a son, she was still a virgin even after the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was not until then she and Joseph uh, took up their normal marriage relationship that she ceased to be a virgin. But that is not how Mormons uh, will tell us. Uh, they believe that the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ occurred when Elohim, their heavenly father, came down to earth, uh, went into uh, the room, if you like, where a young girl called Mary, who was a virgin, they had a literal relationship. And when he left, she was no longer a virgin. And then nine months later, she gave birth to the Lord Jesus Christ. So their understanding of the incarnation is very different from what the Bible would teach us. And uh, the other thing too is that the Bible makes it plain that everything that exists was created by the Lord Jesus Christ. We read in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth in the opening words of Genesis. And in John 1, 3, John wrote, all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. And in Colossians 1, 16, Paul speaking of Christ said, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. All things were created by him and for him. So everything that was created was created by the Lord Jesus Christ. He himself was not a created being. And again, that's gonna have relevance where the Jehovah's Witnesses are concerned. Another thing about the Lord Jesus Christ is, uh, and this is something that Christian theologians have argued about, uh, was the Lord Jesus Christ able not to sin? No, was he peccable that he could have sinned, but he didn't? Or was he not able to sin? In other words, that he was impeccable, that he couldn't possibly have sinned. Well, I, of course, I believe with all my heart that he was impeccable because he was God manifest in the flesh. And in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. But when you compare those teachings with what Mormonism teaches, now they don't say that he sinned, but they basically teach that he was a spirit child born to Elohim, uh, one of his wives. Lucifer was his brother. And of course, Lucifer sinned. And you and I, our spirit, we're spirit brothers and sisters of the Lord, and we all know our capability to sin and so on. So I would uh, suggest that the Mormon Jesus would be of the peccable variety, even though they claim that he didn't actually sin. So uh, we see these things about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he himself said, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. In other words, there was no vulnerable point where Satan could tempt Christ into actually sinning. And uh, it is definitely a different Jesus Christ that the Mormons uh, refer to compared to the one of the Bible. Uh, they don't believe that he eternally was pre-existent and co-existent with the Father. They believe that the Father had to begat him as a spirit child. They don't believe that he was truly virgin born as the Bible would teach us. And they don't believe that the Lord Jesus Christ was impeccable. So we've looked at the Father and we've looked at the Son and now what about the Holy Ghost? Uh, well, he, he's had a bit of a checkered career. When Mormonism first started, he wasn't originally part of their Godhead, but eventually he did get incorporated into it. So what does the Bible tell us about the Holy Ghost. Well, in Hebrews 9, 14, we read this, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. 
So the Spirit is eternal. Uh, also in Acts 5, uh, we read of uh, the encounter between Peter and Ananias. Uh, we read, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. So the Holy Ghost is truly God uh, without any doubt, and he is eternal. One thing we need to understand in Mormonism, they differentiate between the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit. You and I as Christians would use those terminologies interchangeable. But the Mormons do differentiate. They say this, the Holy Ghost is a male personage. And that proves that he's not eternal in their understanding. He had to come into being at some stage. He is a male personage of spirit. Uh, another writer, a former president said, the Holy Ghost is a man. He is one of the sons of our Father and our God. So the Holy Ghost is a personage. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, this is what they say. He can only be in one place at one time. That's the Holy Ghost. Though his power and influence can be manifest at one and the same time through all immensity. So the Holy Ghost is limited as to where he can be, but his power and influence can be everywhere, uh, if you like. So they definitely have a very different Holy Ghost from the one revealed to us in the scriptures. Uh, another of their writers says this, the chief agent or agency by which the Holy Ghost accomplishes his work is usually spoken of as the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God. It is a universe filling medium or influence. So uh, we find, first of all, that their Holy Ghost is not eternal. He is one of the sons of their father and their God. Is he God? not in the same sense as the Bibles teach us. Uh, so very much twisted theology when it comes to the Mormon Godhead. Then what about uh, my next heading, which is added accessories. Uh, article number eight of Mormonism says, we believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as it is translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the word of God. So they say, the Book of Mormon is the Word of God, but the Bible is only the Word of God insofar that it's correctly translated. So there is a, a qualification when it comes to the Bible. And if there's any dispute between the two books, contradictions or whatever, the Book of Mormon carries the day. Uh, you remember the four features of a cult and authority in addition to or in place of the Bible? Well, you can see that the authority of the Book of Mormon overrides that of the Bible. They, they also have a subtitle for the Book of Mormon that says, Another Testament of Jesus Christ. It would be better uh, phrased, the Testament of another Jesus Christ, because this is not the Jesus Christ of the Scriptures. So they have, uh, this book has to be accepted as Scriptures. Also, these other two books that I made reference to, the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price, uh, those also are scripture as far as Mormons are concerned. And uh, of course, uh, the Bible itself says that we're not to add to the word of God or take away from it. Um, Proverbs 35 and 6, we read, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. But as I say, the Mormons ignore that and they have these other additional authorities. Uh, Joseph Smith said the Book of Mormon contained the fullness of the everlasting gospel. Yet the truth of the matter is that there's many major doctrines of Mormonism that are not contained in the Book of Mormon. They're in the subsidiary books, if you like. He also described it as the most correct of any book on earth, and a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. Well, this most correct book, I think there's been something like 4,000 plus changes made to it since it was uh, first uh, published. And does it contain the fullness of the Mormon gospel? No, it doesn't include any reference to baptism for the dead. It doesn't include any reference to 
temple and celestial marriage. It doesn't make any reference to plurality of gods. In fact, <laughs> the Book of Mormon, I already told you they're a polytheistic religion that I quoted where different people, including Joseph Smith, uh, said that the Father, Son, Holy Spirit are three gods. But when you read the introduction to the Book of Mormon, uh, there's a statement made by three witnesses saying they witnessed these gold plates uh, that Joseph Smith refers to. And they end up their testimony by saying this, and the honor be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, which is one God. Amen. And then in the Book of Mormon itself, in Second Nephi, uh, chapter 31, we read this, Behold, this is the doctrine of Christ, and the only and true doctrine of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, which is one God. So you can see Mormonism is actually quite a contradictory uh, religion as well. They claim to be polytheistic, yet you know, the Book of Mormon teaches monotheistic uh, views in those quotes that I've just given to you. So these uh, added accessories are these extra books that the Mormons have to accept. Now what about essential extras? That is my next heading. Uh, articles 6 and 9 of the Mormon uh, Articles of Faith say this, we believe in the same organization that existed in the primitive church, namely apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, and so forth. We'll believe all that God has revealed, all that he does now reveal, and we believe that he will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So the Mormons believe that there is ongoing fresh revelation. Uh, they are headed up by a president who they believe has a hotline to heaven and can, if needed, receive fresh revelation from God. Uh, and that actually was very important uh, a number of decades ago because originally Mormonism taught that men of the Negro race could not become priests within the Mormon church. They believed that those with uh, black or dark skin were actually cursed because in the pre-existence they had sided with Lucifer in his battle against Christ. And so their punishment was to come to earth as black people. Uh, and so uh, Mormonism taught that black people can't become priests in the Mormon church. Well, when you had the civil rights movement in America in the 1960s and so on, well, teaching me that certainly was not politically correct. Uh, and uh, of course, there was great pressure uh, upon them to uh, change their teachings on it. And uh, uh, I have a, a book by a man called Paul Smith. Uh, it's called Other Gospels. And he, he wrote this in 1974. Mormon theology puts Negroes and Indians in a class by themselves. Negroes cannot become priests and little of any missionary work is done among the Negro people in the African countries. The fact that Negro men are not permitted to be priests becomes a serious point of discrimination when we remember that every male member 12 years of age and upwards is a priest except in extremely rare circumstances. In a recent interview, the president of the Canadian Mission of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was quoted as saying, through revelation to Joseph Smith, it's been a policy since the beginning of our church that Negroes could not hold the priesthood till such time as the Lord gave our prophet a new revelation. In all probability, just as they gave into the demands of the United States government in regard to polygamy, that was at the end of the 19th century, the Mormons officially had to ditch polygamy in order to become a state, the state of Utah. This man wrote, they will eventually have to give in to the pressure that must be coming from all sources in connection with the Negro. We may live to see a new manifesto in the near future. Well, that was written in 1974. Well, four years later, the then president of the Mormon church, Spencer Kimball, he made the following announcement. We have pleaded long and earnestly in behalf of these, our faithful brethren, spending many hours in the upper room of the temple, supplicating the Lord for divine guidance. He has heard our prayers, and by revelation has confirmed that all worthy male members of the church may be ordained to the priesthood without regard for race or color. So there you have it. If you've got a teaching or a doctrine that's not politically correct, it's very handy to have 
a leader who has a hot line to heaven can get fresh revelation and get the whole thing changed around. Another essential extra is that Mormons believe that Joseph Smith will have the final say on judgment. Brigham Young said this, no man or woman in this dispensation will ever enter the celestial kingdom of God without the consent of Joseph Smith. Every man and woman must have the certificate of Joseph Smith Jr. as a passport to their entrance into the mansion where God and Christ are. And then the uh, Deseret News, which is a Mormon newspaper in 1968 wrote, no man or woman in this dispensation will ever enter the celestial kingdom of God without the consent of Joseph Smith. Well, how does uh, the Bible uh, regard these essential extras? Do we have apostles and prophets today? While Paul writing in Ephesians 2.20 spoke of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophet Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, I'm no builder or handyman, but I know this, when you're putting up a building, you lay one foundation and then you start putting bricks on top of that. Well, after you put a lot of rows of bricks on, you don't say, well, I'm going to put another foundation. No, you don't do that. There's only one foundation which is laid, and it was laid upon the apostles of the time of Jesus and the prophets of the Old Testament and Jesus Christ himself. Is there ongoing additional extra biblical revelation today. Hebrews 1 says this, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Uh, Matthew Henry, the great commentator, he said this, the excellency of the gospel revelation above the former consists in these things. It is the final the finishing revelation given forth in the last days of divine revelation to which nothing is to be added, but the canon of scripture is to be settled and sealed. Uh, I am a sola scriptura man. Uh, if you go to our ministry YouTube site, uh, just over a year ago, I was at a conference in Illinois and the topic I was allocated was sola scriptura. So there's no apostles and prophets today, despite what the Mormons say, despite what the new apostolic reformation grouping says today. Secondly, is Joseph Smith God's appointed judge? Well, in John 5, 22, the Lord says this, the father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the son. Then in Acts 17, when Paul was preaching uh, on Mars Hill, he rounded off by saying this to the philosophers who were listening because he hath appointed the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. There's only one judge, and it is the Lord Jesus Christ. Did Joseph Smith hold the keys to the kingdom of heaven? No. The Lord Jesus Christ holds those. In Matthew uh, 25, he, he speaks of the peoples gathered before him. And we read in verse 33, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The one who owes the keys of entrance into the kingdom of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. Very quickly, uh, my next heading is Heavenly Heresies. Uh, Mormonism holds out hope of three possible heavens. Uh, the top of the charts is the celestial heaven. And this is for obedient, moral living Mormons who have been married in a Mormon temple. And uh, this holds out the hope of exaltation to Godhood itself. And uh, they hope uh, if they qualify for this, that they too will be given a planet that they and their wife or wives will populate for all eternity. Uh, there's a little couplet that's uh, often employed when uh, summing up the teaching of Mormonism, and it goes like this, as man is, God once was, 
as God is, man may become. So that's the celestial heaven. Then they have the terrestrial heaven. Uh, and this is for non-Mormon, but religious people who are good people. Uh, well, they probably think we would go. And then the third is what they call the telestial heaven. And this is where the majority of the wicked people will go. But first of all, they probably have to spend time in a place of purification called a spirit prison. Uh, it's a bit like a Mormon uh, version of uh, purgatory. In fact, there are great similarities between Mormonism and Roman Catholicism. And God willing, at the church service tomorrow morning, I will have a number of handouts available to people. And one of them will list eight features in Mormonism that kind of are very similar to teachings in Roman Catholicism. So heavenly heresies, they hold out hope of three uh, heavens. But what does the Bible teach? What is the hope for true believers? First Peter chapter one, verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. So there we have these heavenly heresies. And my final heading is satanic salvation. Simply meaning that the salvation offered by Mormonism is devilish. It is no salvation whatsoever. As I've mentioned perhaps earlier, Mormonism uses terminology that you and I would identify with, but their understanding of it is very different. When it comes to salvation, Mormons subdivide it into two classes. There's general salvation, and then there's individual personal salvation. So what is general salvation? Uh, there's the book, a book that I have. It's called Gospel Principles. This is given to people considering joining the Mormon church. And it says this. Uh, the heading is Christ's atonement and resurrection brings resurrection to all. And this is what it says. On the third day after his crucifixion, Christ took up his body again and became the first person to be resurrected. Christ thus overcame physical death. Because of his atonement, all persons born on this earth will be resurrected. In the same way Jesus was resurrected, so our spirits will be reunited with our bodies. This condition is called immortality. So they believe that generally the death of Christ has assured immortal immortality for everyone we will all be one day resurrected but do they believe the death of christ has solved the sin problem uh, where we are concerned is it salvation by grace alone through faith alone in christ alone no not at all for them individual salvation is really called exaltation and later in the book it says this under the heading requirements for exaltation Latter-day Saints are taught that now is the time to fulfill the requirements for exaltation. There are specific ordinances we must have received to be exalted. We must be baptized and confirmed as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ. We must receive the Holy Ghost. We must receive the Temple Endowment. We must be married for time and eternity. And then there are also many laws we have to obey to qualify for exaltation. Love God and worship him, have faith in Jesus Christ. Of course, that's the Mormon Jesus. Live the law of chastity, repent of our wrongdoings, pay honest tithes and offerings, be honest in our dealings, speak the truth always, obey the word of wisdom, which means you abstain from tea, coffee and alcohol, keep the Sabbath day holy. So Mormonism is for individual salvation to get the condemnation for your sin removed, the death of Christ, makes it possible, but you have a whole ritualistic system to fulfill, again, very similar to Roman Catholicism, which teaches that the sacraments of the new covenant are necessary for salvation. But you know the scriptures that teach that it's not of works, for by grace you save through faith, and not, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And as for religious ritual, whether it be baptism or any of these things, 
Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ didn't just guarantee immortality. The Bible says he was raised again for our justification. And when God justifies you, he, if you've been born again, he says to you, my law has no claim against you. There's no penalty for you to pay. That's what it means to be justified. And the reason he can do that is because Christ as your substitute suffered the penalty of the broken law. And the fact that his sacrifice was accepted was confirmed by the resurrection. If his sacrifice hadn't have been suitable, Christ would still be in the grave. So uh, Mormon salvation it is satanic. It is not any use whatsoever uh, at all. So those very much uh, are uh, the things uh, that the Mormons teach that you have to do in order to be saved. What about witnessing? Uh, I'll finish just with this very briefly. Uh, quite often in Northern Ireland I would encounter Mormons in different places and there's a town called Lisburn uh, that is not too far away from where I, I live and uh, maybe 18 months ago I was walking down Bow Street and I could see two Mormon sisters who were witnessing in Bow Street and they were speaking to somebody. So I walked past and I stopped at a shop window and I kind of uh, loitered with intent, hoping that I might get an opportunity to speak to them. And sure enough, they eventually finished with who they were talking to. And I was walking in their direction and one of them sort of went, hi. And I went, hello. And they said, could we speak to you? And uh, they said, is there anything in this world that makes you really happy? And I said, oh, I'm so glad you asked me that. I said, there is one thing that makes me happy. I have the assurance that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, he died and suffered the punishment that I should suffer for my sins. And through faith in him, I have been born again and saved. And I know that when I die, I am going to be with him for all eternity. And they looked at me and one of them went, wow. And then they wanted to talk to me. So they started to talk to me and they were talking about Jesus Christ and so on. So I, I, I let them talk for a while. And then I said, could, could I maybe ask you one question? And they said, sure. I said, tell me, how did your Jesus Christ get his earthly body? And they said, well, through the Holy Ghost and Mary. I said, that's not actually what your church teaches. And she said, no. I said, no, your church teaches that your heavenly father, Elohim, came to earth, had a literal relationship with Mary, and as a result of that union, Jesus was born. Oh, no, I don't know. I've never heard that. I said, well, I'll send you quotations by many leading figures in Mormonism, uh, and uh, I'll send those to you. So that's the way it was left. So later that day, I printed off the quotations, and the only address I had to send them to was the Mormon church in Lisbon. So I posted it off. After about five days in my mailbox were the two letters that I had sent. They were returned to me. And the note was, church gates locked, could not deliver. So I thought, well, I'll keep these because you never know, I might meet them again in Lisbon. So a few weeks later, I was in Bow Street and guess who I saw? Sister Thu and Sister Kaufman. So I went up and I said, hello, oh, hello. I said, I sent you those quotes to the church, uh, but they didn't get delivered. Oh, she says, no, we, we, we don't stay at the church. I says, well, I realize that, but I just happened to have them with me. So I handed these to them and they said, thank you very much. And I said, by the way, as well as the quotes, there's actually a photograph of my wife, Margaret and I, which was taken on our 30th wedding anniversary. And I said, you may wonder, why on earth has he given us that photograph? I said, well, first of all, it might refresh your memory that we've had a few chats together. But I said, secondly, I want you to know that my wife and I, we actually met in 1986 in a holiday trip to the Holy Land, to Israel. And I said, the wonderful thing is when you go to Israel, and you can actually see places that are mentioned in the Bible, you can read about 
characters and there's evidence uh, that they were there and the cultural things and all the archaeology, it all squares up with the Bible. I says, isn't it very interesting that when it comes to the Book of Mormon, there is not one shred of archaeological evidence or cultural evidence to back up the story that is contained in the Book of Mormon. And I said, maybe you might want to think about that. So they took it and they went off. So I, I just pray that perhaps something might strike a chord with them and might cause them to search and so on. The glorious truth is that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin if we put our faith and trust in him. And sadly, when it comes to Mormonism, they do not believe that. Brigham Young, and I'm going to close with this, Brigham Young said this, there are sins that men commit for which they cannot receive forgiveness in this world or in that which is to come. It is true that the blood of the Son of God was shed for sins through the fall and those committed by men. Yet man can commit sins which it can never remit. They must be atoned for by the blood of the man. And then he cites an example and he says, the blood of Christ will never wipe that out. Your own blood must atone for it. And over the years in the state of Utah, when it comes to execution for a murderer, they have the option that they can be put to death by firing squad. And a number of people have opted for that. Uh, back in 1977, there was a, a man raised as a Mormon called Gary Gilmore, and he opted for firing squad execution, wanting his blood to be shed by way of atonement. Uh, and then in 2010, another man called Ronnie Lee Gardner, he opted to be uh, killed, executed by firing squad. And in a report in the Daily Mail newspaper, it says this, Gardner reportedly chose this method of death in the hope the bullets fired into his heart would be his entrance fee to heaven. Indeed, he ate his last meal, steak, lobster, tail, apple pie, vanilla, blah, blah, two days before his execution, so that he could embark on a 48-hour spiritual fast. I guess it's my Mormon heritage, Gardner said some years ago. So what a tragic religion that there's even supposedly some sins that the blood of Christ does not atone for, and you would be forced to actually shed your own blood. But praise God, we're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. I hope that the Lord will use this uh, to help you understand and understand that Mormon terminology sounds biblical, but it means very different things. And if we know the genuine, then we can recognize the false and we're able then to share the truth with these people. So God bless, and uh, in about maybe 20 minutes at high noon, uh, we will then reconvene uh, to uh, look at the Jehovah's Witnesses. God bless.